नाम श्रेष्ठ मनुमपी षचिपुत्र अत्रस्वूप्रज उपुरी मथुरी गोष्ठवाठी राधा कुंद गिरीवर ओ राधिका माधवाशा प्राप्त यसित कृपया श्री गुरु तंगस्मी नींदुकोत्कन विकसत नीपप्रसून छवि प्रोद्वीकृत्य भुज हरिहरी मुहो नृत्यंगलदश्रुनिर्जरचय सिंचतमूर्वीतल गायजपाशद परिवृत तम गोरचंद्रस्तुम परिपालित प्रबलित सानंदमालोकित प्रत्याशंसुफल मनो सुमन फलोदय विधो सामोदमादित वृंदारण्य भुवि प्रकाश मधुर सर्वातिशायी स्प्रिया श्रिया राधा माधव प्रमोदय उल्लासकुम जय रूप सनातन भट्टर गुणा श्री जीव गोपाल भट्टदास रघुनाथ ए छय गोसाय रखोरी चरण वंदन जहाँ हुए थे विघ्न नाश अभीष्ट पुरो हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे जय जय श्री राधे जय जय श्री राधे जय जय श्री राधे श्याम सो वेन अनुच्छेद नंबर फोर ऑफ प्रीति संदर्भ and uh, the discussion is on different kinds of mukti so uh, in this particular section we're going to talk about jivan mukti and utkranta mukti so uh, or as the term he's using here for utkranta mukti will be antima mukti which means final mukti though uh, i'm not quite sure whether he's using it grammatically means so the latter of the two or whether he means it in some kind of actual final sense Anyway, let's see here. He says, "Idrishameva tan mukti lakshanam, Sri Kapileye mukta asrayam ityadi chatushtaye darshitam." So this is in the, uh, the the what we call Kapileya. So the last, uh, I believe, it's ten chapters or so of the uh, of the third canto is the teachings of Kapila to Devahuti. and those teachings are mostly connected to sankhya and yoga philosophy so this is uh, the uh, the 28th chapter where he talks about mukti the the jivan mukta state so the characteristics of a jivan mukta are found in the instructions of bhagwan kapila in the four verses so actually jiva goswami doesn't quote the full four verses here but only points out Uh, which words in each of the four verses are uh, to be considered uh, descriptive of the jivan mukta so i'm going to uh, we're, we're going to read all the four verses in the incomplete so these are 
Canto 3, chapter 28, verses 35 to 38. So you can uh, examine those verses from other translations if you so would desire. So the first day, the beginning is the word muktasrayam. Muktasrayam yarhi nirvishayam viraktam nirvanam ritchati manah sahasayatharchi Atmana matra purusho vyavadhana mekam anvikshate pratinivritta guna pravaha. So, um, the mind, manaha, that is free of any support, muktasraya. So, the mind has to have some support. Or the mind doesn't exist without thoughts. And uh, all through the yoga system, the yoga system to reach the case stage of nirvikalpa samadhi or uh, the, the higher levels, the higher reaches of samadhi when one uh, comes to the uh, point of actually having kaivalya, then the mind has to be completely, well, when the, the mind uh, has to be completely separated from any object of thought. So the yoga system, generally speaking, uses the word alambana or avalambana, more alambana, that, what, that uh, in the process of meditation that you focus on one particular thing, uh, whether it's uh, mantra or so on, there's a whole system devised uh, for alambanas of the mind and gradually one uh, becomes, th those alambanas become more and more subtle until finally the mind can totally escape from any uh, object of thought whatsoever. Uh, the process of stilling the mind by focusing it on one thing, which is called the alambana. So the ashraya, the word ashraya is really the same here as alambana, muktashraya. When the mind has no nothing to think of, it has no shelter, no support. So when the mind is free from support and near vishayam, has no objects, devoid of any objects, viraktam, so Vairagya is detached. It is extinguished. It attains extinguishment, nirvana. Like suddenly, and the word suddenly here is there. Oops, I'm missing suddenly in the translation. So it suddenly becomes uh, extinguished, just like a flame that has no oil or fuel to support it. Like the fuel says, like the flame of a lamp that comes to an end when the Oil is finished. So, Atmanam Atra Purusho Avyavadhanam Ekam Anvikshate Pratinivritta Guna Pravaha. So, the spiritual being, the Purusha, so this gives away the, you know, the whole system of yoga and Sankhya, is based on, you know, uses the terms Purusha and Prakriti. So, in the Bhagavatam, when, when the word Purusha is being used, in the Gita also, when the word Purusha is being used, it indicates that uh, the uh, Sankhya and Yoga philosophies are being incorporated into the broader teaching. So the spiritual being or Purusha, being free from the flow of the gunas of nature, Pratinivritta Guna Pravaha, sees the self, Atmanam, uh, uh, Avyavadhana mekam, without any, uh, the, the one self, sees the one self without any intervening covering. So here the word Atman, I mean the commentaries, so the, the, the commentaries that are given, actually even here Jiva says, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm reading the verse uh, entirely. The Jiva Goswami here, he has, um, Tatrahi pratinivritta guna pravaha san atmanam paramatmanam ikshate iti muktasraya mityado. So in this verse, that's muktasraya mityado, in this particular verse, uh, the sim symptom that he's focusing on, although the entire verse could be used as a characteristic of the uh, jivan mukta, he particularly likes pratinivritta guna pravaha, that the, that the uh, gunas of material nature have been ceased, uh, have, have been uh, have the, free from the flow of the gunas of nature. He sees the self, Atmanam, and, uh, well, I'm, I'm, 
I'm a, a little bit uh, uh, of a trying to understand here what Jiva Goswami is uh, thinking because uh, we're talking about uh, Jivan Mukta. So the Jivan Mukta can have be in the Brahma Sakshatkar. And we haven't really been talking about Paramatma Sakshatkar, but this would seem to be Paramatma Sakshatkar because he talks about the Atmanam being the Paramatman. So in that case, uh, at any rate, either way, Atmanam or Paramatmanam, Jiva Goswami has Paramatma here. He says that Atma should be understood as Paramatma. So he sees the Paramatma, and then this important word that is uh, is Avyavadhanam, which he's going to use a little bit later on in the second part of this fourth uh, fourth Anuched. Uh, so I think that's uh, so, and he used it before also, the idea that there's no obstruction, and no, nothing that's nothing that stands between the the uh, consciousness and the supreme. So when one has eliminated any of the uh, all the upadis, all the other objects for the mind, all the other all, all the other intervening, all the other things that intervene between uh, one's consciousness and the direct perception of the supreme, those are all eliminated, uh, and that's called avyavadhana. Avyavadhana means a, a separation, or a, 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 it usually means an, a, an intervening space. Right, that there's a vyavadhan, there's something that separates two things. So we could use it as an uh, as obstruction or interven intervening, uh, something that's intervening here. So and also ekam, so ekamatmanam. So in this verse here, the ekamatmanam, the meaning that the, the ekatmata, uh, the the atma, the what the single atma is the paramatma, and the jiva is uh, connected to that. At any rate, that's the, those are the things that he takes. Pratinivritta guna pravaha, being free from the from the uh, flow of the gunas of the material nature, and uh, seeing the paramatma. Those are the two characteristics of the jivan mukta here. The jivan part will come in the last verse. So pyetaya charamaya manaso nivritya. Tasmin mahim yavasita kasuka dukha bhahi ahe tutuamapyasati kartari dukha yoriat swatman vidatta palabda paratma kashtaha. So sopi etaya charamaya manaso nivritya. So nivritti means cessation. So we have that, you know, that uh, chitta vritti nirodha. The chitta vritti nirodha, that's nivritti is the, the idea there. So here it's charamaya nivritya. So that nirvana that was referred to in the previous verse, that's the charamaya nivritya. So by this, uh, uh, ultimate dissolution of the mind. So that yogi, tasmin mahim avasitaha. So the word avasitaha is avasana. We've also seen the word pariyavasana uh, previously. Avasana means to, av avasana means to come to an end, right? So one comes to a. Uh, but here the um, the commentary is saying having nishtang nishtang prapta to become fixed in. So he becomes fixed in his mahimni in that mahim mahimanam in his own glory. Now that's often that word sve mahimni. The idea, where is God situated? He's situated in, in, in his own glory. So the jiva also is situated in his own glory. In this particular case, we're following the yoga system here. So he's, he's uh, describing it according to the, the concepts and ideas of, of, the, of the yoga system. So the final situation, kaivalya, there means to be situated in one's own glory. So the jiva, you know, of course, that this is going to be... This is, as always here, we're having this dual language, right? That you're having this, that, that it's applicable. It can be seen both in terms of the yoga system. And if we restrict it to the, if we confine it to the de definitions given by the yoga system, uh, then they'll be inadequate for explaining the Bhagavat aspect of, uh, of the Supreme Tattva. But this is not, they are not to be separated from the Bhagavat uh, aspect of the Supreme. They are part of the, so therefore, to be situated in one's own glory. To be situated in one's own glory means when you're free from the upadis of the material body, free from the upadis of the gross and subtle bodies, like we saw in yesterday's verse, you know, that uh, sada sada rupe, 
that um, when the sudden sada sad lupe when they come to a to a an, when they they're removed these external coverings then one has direct perception of of the supreme tra truth that tat brahma darshan so and one is situated in one's own glory so to be situated in one's own glory for a vaishnava means to be situated in krishna's glory mm. to see one's own identity and relationship to krishna so there's really no um, there's no conflict in the two meanings, to be situated in one's Siddha Deha, to be situated in one's Siddha Swarup, and to be engaged in direct eternal service with the Supreme Person, in the to be situated in the divine world, in the Nitya Lila, that those things are actually the goal of the Bhakti system also. So it's just a question of the concept that defines the idea of Mahima. And what is that? But here he says, so Abhasana, so I, as I explained already, the Abhasita is the past participle, so he has been, he has expired or he has come to his conclusion in his own glory. So it's his final, his final stage. So the Charamaya, the Charama means the ultimate, right? So Charamaya Manaso Nivritya Tasmin Mahimni Abhasita Sukha Dukha Bahye. So this Mahima, is external bahie to sukha and dukkha to the material sufferings and joys. He tuttvam apiyasati kartari dukkha yoriyat swatman vidhatte upalabdha paratma kashta. So this is a little bit of a difficult thing to direct understanding. But he tuttvam, so that the, the, the what, what has been the what is um, the vidhatte, so that your uh, having attained upalabdha paratma kashtaha, so having attained the topmost state of union with the paramatma, mm -hmm. so kashta means you kashta is the ultimate limit, like sima, and upalabdha attained, so attained, having attained the, the, the highest concept or the highest understanding or the highest realization of the supreme soul, like that, then he recognizes that the uh, that uh, the cause of the dukkha yor so it's very nice here that he uses dukkha yor the two the two miseries so happiness in this world and uh, and suffering happiness is also considered a misery by the uh, yogi because uh, he knows that the, that well for a Vaishnava also material happiness devoid of Krishna bhakti materially happiness devoid of uh, consciousness of Krishna, that that's not uh, happiness at all. Why would not choose life in Swarga or Brahma Loka or even liberation, whatever is called happiness by the uh, uh, people within the search for the Purusharthas, that they do not uh, really know what happiness is at all. So they call it a misery. So the two miseries. So the source of the two miseries is the asati kartari, the asat karta, the false ego, the false doer, ahankara. I am the doer. The idea that I am the doer. I'm not. I'm. I'm not the doer. It's when I think that I'm the doer. I think I'm the cause of the effects that uh, govern me. Then that's a, that is called illusion. So the source, the cause of suffering, whether it's happiness, called happiness or called suffering, whether it's called happiness or not, it's all suffering. So the reason that that is going on is because one has the false sense of, the, of doership. So here the translation is, though this, all, through this ultimate dissolution of his mind, that very Purusha becomes firmly situated in the glory that is beyond misery and happiness. Having realized the topmost state of union with the Supreme Self, he realizes that the cause of the two miseries, in other words, misery and happiness, that he attributed to the Self were related to the false ego. Very nice. That's a very nice one. Through this ultimate dissolution of his mind, that very Purusha becomes firmly, firmly situated in the glory that is beyond misery and happiness. Having realized the topmost state of union with the Supreme Self, he realizes that the cause of the two miseries, that is misery and happiness, that he attributed to the Self, 
were in fact related to the false ego. So those ones, so the words that he takes out of this verse that he considers particularly symptomatic of the uh, Jivan Mukta state are being firmly situated in that glory. I'll read what he says. He's getting Swarupa Bhute Mahimni. So the, he's translated Mahimni as being the glory of his own essential nature. Swarupa Bhute, to be situated in, in, the, in his own essential nature. He uh, and avasito is nishtang prapta. So the words he took was mahimni avasito, being firmly situated in the glory of his own essential nature. He upalabda paratma kashta realizes the topmost state of union with the supreme self. So those are the two characteristics, the two words that that he takes, or, or the two phrases that he takes out of the verse as being particularly symptomatic of the liberated soul. But like I say, you could take the whole verse and uh, th those, you know, and analyze why those particular ideas have been uh, given some favored status. The third verse. Dehaṁ chataṁ na charama stitam uttitaṁ va Siddho vipashyati yado dhyagamat swarupam Daivad upeta mata daiva vrashada petam Vaso yata parikritam madirama dandha So this verse is a bit of a toughie in terms of the concept that's, that's there. And um, he says, one in this ultimate stage of perfection, so charamaha, Having realized his essential nature, adhyagamat swarupam, knows not whether he is sitting or standing, stitam uttitangva deham. So he doesn't see whether his, his body is sitting or standing. Let's change that. Whether his body is sitting or standing. Or whether by the will of fate it has moved to a different location. Daivad upetam atha daiva vashad apetam. Whether by fate it has moved up. So that this, is, this will come up in the next uh, in the next verse also. The idea of proud of the karma, and we already saw in the previous one also this idea of the kartari, the asati kartari. So when one is uh, when when one is bodily conscious, then one's always conscious of the activities of the body. And of uh, and of what he is uh, what he is doing, so um, so here he says that just like one blinded by drunkenness, vaso yatha parikritam madira madandha. So whether by he is unaware of the cloth that he around it is around his waist, whether it is there or not. So this idea. So we see this in the activities of the. Uh, well, it's a, um, like, for instance, Nityananda Prabhu, or many of the ecstatic devotees. And it's there, there in the Bhagavatam also, in the seventh canto, for the first time, we see uh, some uh, description of the, the ecstatic devotee in, in Prahlad. And uh, then in the eleventh canto, of course, it, uh, it says, Evam Gratak Svapriya Nama Kirtya Jata Nuraga Priya Chitta Uchai. Hasatyato roditi roti unmadava nrityati loka bahya. So this idea of loka bahya being completely indifferent to the external world and laughing, dancing, he's being possessed. The idea of possession, the idea of being possessed by the spirit. So the uh, idea of, uh, of ecsta ecstasy, ecstasy standing outside oneself in the, in the sense that one is no longer um, a, a part of the... The, of the bodily activity. So here in this in particular verse says, Daiva adupetam atava daiva vashad upetam. So the idea upetam apetam, whether you know, whether he, he's coming or going, he has no no uh, direct sense of that. So his activities in relationship to this world have come to a are, are being governed by something other than his own false ego. 
by his so that's uh, where we can come to some you know that there's uh, it's a little difficult for a few person in the western concept to to uh, uh, understand this uh, philosophy of ecstasy and uh, some people have it and the, you know they, there are ecstatic christians also who uh, who are possessed by the spirit and who speak in tongues and do things like this and also we see uh, that uh, there are Sufi sects in Islam also that uh, try to uh, promote ecstasy. And also, uh, in, in, perhaps it's even more primitive and associated with uh, shamanic uh, cults, like, uh, you know, in the, uh, usually associated with voodoo and, uh, and, and uh, santeria and things like that, uh, where the, and also in Nepal, they have this, and even in the Buddhist, uh, in the Tibetan Buddhism, the Tibetan, the ancient T Tibetan religion that was the, the pre-Buddhistic religion in Tibet was also a shamanic uh, religion. And the shamanic religions are quite widespread throughout uh, the world, especially where there are a pre-civilizations. Uh, pre, uh, so in, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism and in the Vaishnava religion also there's a, a certain, um, a certain uh, um, mariada, a certain, uh, a certain uh, uh, power that's ascribed to these kinds of ecstatic states and that one is actually in search of those ecstatic states when Mahaprabhu pre prays, you know, that um, uh, when will I become ecstatic, right? That vadaram gadgadurum thaya gira nayanam galadas truleya vadaram gadgadaru thaya gira kulakair nichitam vapukkada tava namagrahane. Of course, this will come up later in the in the uh, in the Preeti Sandarbha when he starts talking about the sattvika vikaras. So the sattvika vikaras, that is the the word sattva, is sattvika is related to the word sattva. So the idea that when one is situated in one's state of pure being, of the sattva, that uh, then, uh, in other words, when they're not, these sattvic vikaras are d described as being involuntary, um, involuntary uh, reactions, tears coming to the eyes, hair standing on end, and so on, that when one is experiencing rasa, when one experiences some uh, divine uh, emotion, that these, these transformations take our place on the body, one cannot really will them. But some people might be able to will uh, some to some extent or maybe able to fake them, but in actual fact, a sattvika vikar is something that is not, uh, it cannot be uh, voluntarily, it can't be done by the asatkarta, by the false ego. It's something that's, that's uh, done uh, by external forces. One is participating in the internal potency and uh, the internal potency is acting upon the devotee and so the, uh, the devotee is uh, merged into an ocean of rasa and when he's merged into that ocean of rasa, rasa then uh, ecstatic symptoms are naturally transfer, uh, are naturally appear. In, uh, in Bhaktivinoda Thakur's writings you see that he is very much Kabe hoves bolose dinama, Kabe korite Sri Krishna namu charona, Pulakita deho, God God of Wachan, Vivarna ve potu hoibe agamon, Nirantara netre, Bobe osudha. He often prays for the ecstatic symptoms to come. He's you know, taking his cue from, from Mahaprabhu's Shikshastaka. Nevertheless, it's a son the devotee prays for that to, to attain that state when uh, he is invaded by the internal potency and uh, experiences the ecstasies. Not so much that he desires the ecstasies. The ecstasies, uh, there's one famous verse in the uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu where Dharuka, he uh, uh, curses the ecstatic feelings that he has because he's fanning Krishna and at the same time he's looking at Krishna's beauty and his the beauty is so great that he uh, starts to tremble and uh, his, his eyes start to fill with tears and so this becomes an impediment to his service. So uh, the devotee doesn't uh, 
put the ecstatic symptoms over and above the service, rather would prefer to continue with the service rather than to feel like ecstatic. But it's very difficult for a devotee to separate the two. Now, so the point is that the point is to be situated when one is situated in this uh, state of uh, uh, it's well. Uh, Chronicle Paul Goswami gives the example, and you probably heard the example before, that uh, a coconut. If one if one leaves a coconut to dry, a ripe coconut, uh, then the um, the shell, uh, the 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 actual coconut meat inside the shell, uh, it dries up and becomes separated from the shell. So if you shake the coconut, it rattles. Right? So he says that it's like that. That one's uh, that the that there's a complete disjointment or a complete separation of the body, uh, the inner consciousness uh, from the body mind complex. So what does that mean? Does that mean there's no, well, this is also in the in the yoga system. That this is a question that arises. Well, what then is the what then is the con connection? Is there any connection whatsoever? Well, yes. In the, one is situated in one's uh, in one in one's uh, pure self, but one can still govern the actions of the body, and one can dictate to the body what to do. And so, uh, in, in, for instance, in the case of Dharaka, where he um, continues the service, that service is not separate from his um, pure consciousness, but uh, his, uh, he is not uh, attached. He's not, um, he's not being governed by the body-mind complex, but rather he stands outside it and governs it. But uh, yeah, the, the example giving of, of a drunk, well, the, uh, the drunk is also uh, in his own world. The intoxicated person is in his own uh, particular world, in his own particular state of consciousness and is functioning uh, completely according to that uh, realm and has no connection really to the external world uh, in terms of he doesn't uh, in terms of the uh, of what people think and uh, of what is expected of him and so on so it's that kind of uh, that kind of thing that liberation so the jivan mukta he's in the body but he's not he's in the world but not of it yes to use an old Phrase. So in this particular uh, verse, it was having jiva, jiva brahmanor yathatmyam adyagamat deham chetyago. So uh, in this verse, the particular points that Jiva Goswami wants to highlight is that he knows his having realized his essential nature, the swarupa, and here he says that he defines that as being a proper knowledge, yathatmyam of the jiva brahma relationship of the relationship of the, the the relationship in oneness or in oneness indifference uh, either of those he recognizes and the fourth verse so dehopi daiva vashaga kalu karma yava swarambakam prati samikshata eva sasu Tang sa prapancham adirurha samadhi yoga swapnam punar navajate prati buddha vastu. So, just as a person who is awake does not relate to the objects seen in a dream, a knower of the substance, prati buddha vastu, the word vastu means substance, I think we've seen that before. The Vastavam Vastu in the first in the second verse of the of the Bhagavatam. Functions, uh, excuse me, situated in Samadhi, Adirurha Samadhi Yoga, does not identify with material objects of this world. Uh, the Saprapancham. His body also, along with the senses, functions being controlled by providence until the prarabdha karma comes to an end. Yavat swarambakam. So swarambakam here means prarabdha karma. 
So let's see that again. Dehopi, the body also. Daiva Vashaga is under the control of Daiva. Under the, so Daiva means the would mean proud of the karma, or it can mean uh, some divine external force. So the, as far as the body is concerned, well, the body is going to go through its uh, its prarabdha. Of course, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, we say that uh, the prarabdha karma also is eliminated by pure devotion, meaning that uh, well, the concept is still that the that uh, one is no longer governed uh, by previous uh, pious and sinful activities, but one is directly under the control of uh, the internal potency. So even though one may seem to be following Prarabdha, for instance, my body is going to die. So that death is a part of my Prarabdha karma. Well, I'm a devotee, so I'm supposed to be free from Prarabdha karma. Does that mean I'm going to live forever? Well, later on we'll see there's a discussion about uh, Dhruva who in the Bhagavatam is said to have been raised to the spiritual world in his self-same body, that his body became transferred. There's a discussion of the, 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 the spiritualization of the, of the body of a devotee. So the body of a devotee is, even within this world, is spiritualized, but that doesn't mean uh, that uh, it doesn't appear to be undergoing the uh, changes uh, that are... Uh, ordained by the prarabdha. So he says here, until the prarabdha karma is finished. The example is usually given of a potter's wheel, right? The potter's wheel turns and turns and turns. And even after the potter has stopped um, turning it, it's still going to go around and around and around until finally it stops. So it's the same thing that here in this particular case, the, the devotee being situated either entirely in his own uh, Swarupa, or the liberated Jivan Mukta, being situated in internally, is situated in his own Swarup. That uh, externally, his, it, it appears that proud of the karma is still governing his life. He might get sick, he might, uh, uh, and so many things might happen to him. But because he's uh, separated from the bodily consciousness, therefore those things do not disrupt the single stream of his mind in its consciousness towards God. So, Dehopi Daiva Vashaga Kalu Karma Yavat Psarambakam Prati Samikshata Eva Sasu. Sasu here means living. So, uh, that uh, wasn't uh, in the translation. I have to uh, highlight that in the translation because the idea is of Jivan Mukta. So, the word Sasu uh, would mean that he's living and he's still in his day in, with his body, life heirs, they're still there. So he's still within the world. But tam eva, so tam deham, saprapancham, or tam asu, the, 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 the life heirs and the body, he, he sees the, the along with the entire material creation. Uh, being situated, adirudha samadhi yoga, that also didn't come out in the translation, the word adirudha. So adirudha means to be well. We see that word adirudha come up uh, comes up a few times. That uh, you know we have yoga arudha, aruruksho muner yogam, karma karana mutchate, yoga arudha syatasyaiva shamak karana mutchate. So that's arudha yoga, and then we have uh, of course in uh, arudha uh, mahabhav, adirudha mahabhav. So here's adirudha. You have that, uh, what is it, etah, etah param kalugopa vadvo krishne paratmani adirudha bhava. So we have adirudha bhava for Krishna. So the uh, word adirudha means rudha comes from climbing, you know, from from rising up, so coming up. So adirudha means having arisen to the highest stage. So this adi adirudha samadhi yoga, who have climbed to the state of samadhi yoga, who have attained the state of samadhi yoga. So they uh, see, they na bhajate. So rather than bhajate, so the, the word is bhajate. Uh, so not seeing, so I don't think we will have to change that also. Does not identify with material objects, well that's a little bit better. So he does not become absorbed, 
doesn't become involved uh, with the body and uh, with the material nature, uh, just in the way that someone who is awakened from sleep doesn't again become uh, doesn't again become attached to the objects of the dream world. Of course, uh, in some cases, the dream is so pleasant that one thinks, "Ah, uh, let me go back to bed. <laughs> let me let me stay for a few more minutes with my uh, uh, sleeping." Uh, so that I can taste the pleasures of the dream a little longer. But uh, in actual fact, when one wakes up, then one knows that the dream is, uh, uh, is no matter how pleasant, that the dream was an illusion, and one can uh, drop, drop it and without uh, much uh, attachment. So in the same way, when one is situated, uh, the body is going on according to its karmas, according to its the, its destiny, whether that destiny is in the hands of his past material karmas, as we would say for the yogi, and the jnanis themselves say that. The jnanis don't have a, the jnanis don't uh, claim that uh, proud of the karma comes to an end. And in this particular case, uh, it, it, it uh, seems to be saying the same thing. It says the same thing. But we Vaishnavas, we believe that uh, proud of the karma, proud of the karmeti, virauti uh, veda, that yad brahma sakshat kriti nishthayati vinashamayati vinana bhogai apaiti namas puranena tate proud of the karmeti virauti veda. So that uh, that proud of the karma, which does not come to an end, even by brahma sakshat kara, yad uh, that comes with the uh, with the manifestation, with the revelation of the holy name. So when one exactly when one comes to the uh, a direct experience of the holy name, namas puranena tate the karmeti viroti veda. That the veda claims, the veda states. At least our the, the uh, shastras that we follow, they say that they tell us that the holy name brings an end to even proud of the karma. So that's in the first chapter of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, where it talks about the six characteristics of bhakti. Then uh, Klesha Gni ends all suffering. That's the first characteristic of, of, of bhakti. And so Klesha Gni, there are four kinds of karmas, one of which is prarabdha. And so uh, bhakti destroys all these four kinds of uh, Klesha. So once again, the symptoms of mukti in the first of these verses is that on becoming free from the flow of the gunas of nature, the yogi sees the one self as the parama and the paramat. In the second, being firmly situated in the glory of his own nature, he attains unity with the Supreme. And in the third, having realized his self and Brahman. And in the fourth, a knower of the substance. So that's in accordance with the, with the commentary. So a knower of the substance. So that's worthy of uh, all the four verses in total are uh, are worthy of uh, of study, and are very much in line with uh, the teachings of the Sankhya and Yoga school, like the Yoga Sutra. So therefore, it says, "Tasmad asya prarabdha karma matranam anabini naiva bhogaha." Now this is also in, in, in keeping with the last verse of the four, where it says, Therefore, uh, he experiences only his prarabdha karma without becoming engrossed in it. Uh, so prarabdha karmanam anab, anabhinivation. So abhinivation means becoming engrossed. So he's going on, the, the liberated soul might be experiencing suffering. The body uh, is uh, by its... Uh, predestination of karmas uh, gets diseases, um, gets, uh, dies, experiences old age and the sufferings of old age, but all those things are uh, experienced without any kind of attachment or a kind of con connection of the spiritual self to those sufferings. Or pleasures, as it were. So eva me voktam tatrako moha kakshoka ekatvam anukashyataha. So from the Isha Upanishad, he selected this particular verse. 
and uh, uh, that that uh, that kind of idea is uh, prominent in the Isha Upanishad. But for one who is uh, situated, for one who sees, where is the delusion and lamentation for a person who witnesses oneness everywhere? Ekatvam anupashyata. So uh, Babaji's commentary here. So after, ex uh, wait a second. So after explaining the Jivan Mukta in the form of identification with Brahman, Sri Jiva gives the process to achieve it. Well, I think that uh, it's, it's got something to do with Paramatma here. We often talk about yoga and uh, as being realization of the Atman. This is a difficult subject, and I think that uh, often we don't really understand what's being said. The uh, idea is that the Atman, meaning the Paramatman, so the goal of the, the goal of the yoga system is to attain the Paramatman, and, uh, and, and then it's associated. But what is it associated with? You have three systems, right? You have Jnana, Yoga, and Bhakti. But Yoga, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, for instance, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth chapters, or second chapter also, that you talk about uh, Yoga is very much associated with Karma. So this Nishkama, Karma, Yoga, up to this, including the sixth chapter, where Dhyana Yoga is being uh, spoken of. So in these cases, like for instance in Karma Yoga, very clearly the, goal, the, the Paramatman is being spoken of because it's the God in relationship to this world. The identity of a, of a yogi doesn't really transcend uh, this world except in the fact that he leaves aside his bodily identity, but he doesn't take on a transcendent identity in relationship to Bhagavan. So what is that What is that Atma that he seeks? Well, it's the Atma of this universe, and that's the Paramatma. So uh, the process is explained by Kapila Dev to his mother Devahuti. It is a process of yoga or meditation mixed with bhakti. So that's in the in the in the, the yoga system that's taught by by Kapila, is yoga, but it also contains uh, bhakti. There's a lot of instructions, valuable instructions about bhakti in the in the teachings of Kapila. Done with the resolve to attain union with Brahman. So the first one first meditates on Bhagwan's form. So this is the this is the uh, the where bhakti and is mixed with yoga. One first meditates on Bhagavan's form. So I saw this when I first went to the yoga ashram in, in Rishikesh. And the, I, one of the first uh, discussions I had there, uh, where one of the sannyasis told me, well, one has to give up God also. This is, the, this is in, to attain kaivalya, to attain mukti. One has to give up any, uh, you know, one has to give up, and, and they call this parabhakti. Brahma bhuta prasannatmana shochati na kamshati. Uh, so this mad bhakti labate param, and they consider this to be the bhakti of union. So the total oneness, the, the to become totally merged into God. This is the para bhakti. It's devotion, but it's a it's a different kind of devotion. It's a devotion of oneness. They'll agree, but uh, it's a, such a oneness that there is no uh, there is no division between the uh, lover and the beloved. There's like there's a famous uh, um, a verse by by uh, Kabir, where he says the path of love is very narrow. Uh, as long as there was an I, as long as there was an I in you, uh, then I could not pass. You see, but when there was only you, uh, then uh, one can pass on this path. Not, there's no not room for two on this path of love. There has to be total union. That's what he said. So that they call that parabhakti. So anyway, the point is that it is a process of yoga or meditation mixed with bhakti, done with the resolve to attain union with Brahman. One first meditates on Bhagavan's form, but when his mind becomes fully absorbed on the form, he gradually pulls away his mind from it and makes it devoid of any object. So the idea that Bhagavan is seen as an alambana, 
something to fix the mind on, to concentrate the mind on. But once when the mind is fully absorbed, then the one pulls the mind away from the object. It's actually the previous verse, the verse 20, uh, the verse that preceded uh, these four, uses the example of a, of a, of a hook that is being used. The form of God is being used as a hook to capture the mind, like one captures a fish. And the, the, the form of God is, a, is a, like the bait that one puts on the, on the hook to catch the mind fish. Well, once one's caught the fish, well, then one uh, takes it off the hook. So, uh, <clears throat> such a state is called nirvikalpaka samadhi. Because the yogi is not interested in having a loving relation with Bhagavan, he retracts his mind from him. Such a mind is not attracted to any material objects because the yogi has lost all interest in them. And he is not interested in Bhagavan either. Therefore, his mind attains the state of no thought, nirvana. He loses the distinction between perceiver and perceived. In that state, he does not identify with his gross or subtle body. Thus, he is not aware of his own body. The body continues to function as long as his prarabdha karma lasts. He becomes free of avidya, and has into, this will come up in, the, in, in a minute, the discussion of avidya. We already saw it before, though, that, that you had the idea of avidya, uh, that you have vidya and avidya as being two functions of the material energy. So vidya also has to be given up. That's particularly relevant to the jnana path. So he becomes free of avidya and his intuitive experience of his himself. And he has direct experience of his, uh, of his self. When his prarabdha karma is over, his body drops and he becomes situated in Brahman. So the mantra from Isha Upanishad describes the state of such a realized person. Such a person does not feel any material happiness nor laments for anything. He rises above all dualities. This is the description of a jivan mukta. So now he go on to the next part. So there's only uh, yes, sir. Oops. So uh, yes, let's see. So now go to four point two. <clears throat> so four point two is like this. Uh, it says atantimam. So he's starting a new subject. Ata, ata is usually the start of a new subject. So even though it's the, so in some editions, the, what preceded here in the fourth Anuched actually is attached to the uh, third Anuched, and I think it probably belongs better there. Because you like, when you have Atha, you like to have it starting a new Anuched. Anyway, either way, Atha Antimam Brahma Sakshatkara Lakshanam Muktim Aha. So the word Antimam, it seems to be used here as a, as a, a synonym of Utkranta Mukti, or so we have Jivan Mukti and Utkranta Mukti, Utkranta Mukti coming after death. So Atantimam Muktim, so Antimam actually means the last. And we in the previous we, we used to saw the word Charama, so it could be a, a the, and of course in the previous verse also we had talked about death and dying, but he goes straight to Brahman after dying, whereas in the other kind of Mukti he doesn't. At any rate, this, this verse does not uh, particularly speak about, uh, as far as I can see, doesn't have anything particularly special about dying and going through. Uh, and, uh, you know, but let's just say uh, that uh, this is the way it has been taken by the commentators. And uh, let's say I, I'm leaving it open for the moment and we'll come back. So and it, I'll just translate here as ultimate liberation. So thereafter, the ultimate liberation in the form of identifying with Brahman is uh, described by Sri Sutta. So the verse goes like this. Now this verse followed immediately after we saw it in, in, yes, in the previous one, 1333. So this is 1334. So 1333 was also about uh, 
Well, let's go back to 1330 speed. Let's just remind ourselves of one. This is very interesting because it, it comes, uh, all these verses, which are very strongly uh, seem oriented towards Brahma Gyan, that they in actual fact follow immediately after 1328. And so this is 1333, 1334. 1328 is uh, Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam. That uh, talking about uh, Krishna, about the, the Swayam Bhagavan, and then suddenly we turn in the subject changes to uh, to all these uh, verses about Brahma Jnana. Yesterday's verse or the previous verse was, as I recall, just to go back and see it. Yatre me sadasad rupe pratishidhe swasangvida avidya yatmanikrite iti tad Brahma darshanam where these real and unreal forms that have been created on the self by ignorance are negated through self-knowledge, that is the vision of Brahman. That was the, so the idea that the, is very similar to what we saw with these four verses. That's why I say that these four verses will probably be attached to the previous, uh, to the previous uh, Anuched because it's, they're very much uh, similar to that, that sada sadarupe being create, created by being superimposed on the atma by ignorance, and uh, the, this is also was talked about in those four verses. At any rate, here we have in 4.2, we see that uh, he's quoting the verse which immediately follows that one, which is yadi esha uparata devi maya vaishara dihi matihi. Sampanna eveti vidur mahimni sve mahiyate. So we had mahimni also in those four verses, the idea of mahimni, the sve mahimni mahiyate. This mahimni sve mahiyate. The, the mahiyate, he is uh, exalted, he is glorified, he is worshipped. I think that better than worship, he's glorified, he's, he's exalted. So I put here, this is the translation I'm working with so far. It's quite different, of course, from the other translations, but we can look at it here. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, once again, it's the problem of the interpretation of the verse. Let me just read the translation that I'm working with right now, and then I'll, I'll explain a few things. So the sages, who are not mentioned in this verse, but we have the word vidu. So viduhu without any, vidu means they know. So the they is not being explained, but in the commentary it says the sages know, or people in the know. They say, right? The, our authorities, our aptavakya, the shastras, say eh, that uh, he is sampanna. So sampanna, we've had that, too, it, was, it was used quite a bit. Uh, in the first Anucheda, when we were talking about the six characteristics, this is 1.6 if you want to go back and look at it, that there were six characteristics, and there, so there are the words Sampadyamane, Sampanno, Sampatti, uh, all these words coming from Sampad, the, the, the word Sampatti or Sampad, Daivi Sampad, Asuri Sampad. So Sampad means a possession. To come into the, the real word meaning of sampad is possession. They're usually translated as wealth or treasure, but it means something that you've come into possession of. Right? So one has sampanna, means one has come into the possession of his actual true state. That would be the, the idea of sampanna. So sampanna means successful, uh, achieved. He's achieved, the, he's achieved perfection. Sampanna eva. Iti vidur. So they know him to be perfected. When? When the Esha, now then all these verse, words that follow are all feminine nominative words. Uparata, so this has come to an end. Upara means stop. So Esha uparata, it has stopped. What has stopped? Devi Maya. So Devi Maya. Divine my Daivi Hesha Gunamayi Mama Maya Duratyaya. So Devi, Daivi there, it's Devi or Daivi. So Devi here means goddess. We would usually take gay perhaps the it's a I wonder if there's a if there's a, a an alternative reading here. I should go and check the to see if find that if anybody has put Daivi. I wouldn't be surprised if Daivi were there because Devi is not uh, seems uh, a little bit out of context because it's not being spoken of as a personified. This is why in the commentary, 
they have changed Devi or they've glossed Devi as Dyotamana. So Dyotamana is uh, one of the uh, typical uh, words that's used to gloss Deva or De De Devi, that the gods are in brilliant uh, or they are luminous. So the luminous ones, but, uh, Swami Veda Bharati always used to translate uh, Devi as luminous, the Devas as the luminous beings. So, so I put Goddess Maya for the time, or you could put the, you know, anyway, the, the usual translations being given are the luminous Maya. So then the word Vaisharadi is a bit of a problem. Now Vaisharadi, Visharada, so you sometimes see Visharada as being used to, as a title for Brahmins, Veda Visharada, someone who's an expert or who has come to the understanding of the, uh, the a complete understanding of the Vedas, Veda Visharada, or Tattva Visharada. This kind, this term is used uh, for learned scholars and Brahmins. And so Vaisharadi Matihi, so uh, this uh, this opinion, the, the, or this state of knowledge or state of consciousness. Uh, is there. So the, the whole thing is being said. The, the sages know when the goddess Maya in the form of uh, <clears throat> unerring knowledge withdraws, the jiva attains the wealth of bliss of Brahman and is exalted in his own glory. So I still think I'm going to tweak that a little bit. Uh, let's see, there's, uh, I made some, so just a uh, so in this verse, several words are given unusual interpretations. Vaisharadi is de derived from Visharada, the principal meanings of which are given as experienced, skilled, or proficient, uh, conversant with, etc., or learned, wise, clever, as a speech. All these commentators, all the commentators, starting with Madhva and Sridhara, say that Visharada refers to Ishwar. So Vaisharadi is, but the straightforward meaning seems perfectly acceptable for a prima facie reading of the translation. Maya is generally sui generis, but a Devi means goddess. So Devi Maya is immediately to be read as the goddess Maya. The commentary's conclusion is that the Vaisharadi Matihi is a Maya Vrittihi, which seems to be quite straightforward. So let's, the, and the rest is clear. So the sages know when the goddess Maya in the form of expert knowledge withdraws, the jiva attains the wealth of bliss of Brahman and is exalted in his own glory, in its own glory. So now the next part is, uh, let's see what uh, the, the next part of, the, of that uh, is, uh, is what, um, what uh, the uh, commentary says, what Jiva Goswami says in the commentary. So keep in mind that the, these words are being explained in a different way from the, from the way they were translated. So they had the, the words, I'm reading, I'm trying to read the verse in the way that somebody would read it uh, without Jiva Goswami's insight or without Sridhar Swami's insight and that he would look at the commentary and say, oh yeah, that that's what was intended. But um, even so, even with accepting the intentions of, one of the things that I learned from Swami Veda Bharati was the idea of multiple meanings. That uh, when one is... Um, uh, a native speaker of a particular language, he becomes very, his uh, awareness of the multiple meanings of a word make it possible for him to uh, uh, experience the joke that's in a pun. So a pun means that one, you know, that generally speaking, according to context, one would hear a particular word immediately within the, the context that it's found and not become disturbed by its other meanings, the other meanings it has. But nevertheless, a particular word has a history and a usage. And so, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, and different words uh, related to, if I just use the word, for instance, psychology, which is sprung to my mind right now. So what we mean by psychology, well, there's a very definite meaning of psychology that springs to mind. But if we dig beneath, beneath the immediate meaning of the word, and uh, it uh, takes on uh, multiple facets according to what one knows of human psychology, of what one has studied, of what different branches of psychological research one has, uh, is aware of, and what one thinks of psychology and so on. So the general term contains within it a wealth of information and uh, uh, that can be multivalenced. So 
and the, the ability to have, uh, to have that whole breadth of meaning of a word uh, naturally for a Sanskrit speaker would uh, be there and would lie, underlie any reading that he has of the verse and would make it possible for him to accept uh, that one particular meaning should be taken as predominant. So here he says, Esha Jivan Mukti. So he's what he's doing, he's glossing the verse. So he's going through all the words of the verse, uh, in, in all the words of the verse, putting them in a in a in a, a comprehensible order and explaining each word as he goes. So Esha Jivan Mukti Dashayam Stita. So Esha means this, so he's referring back to the previous verse also. So in this state of Jivan Mukti, uh, there is situated there, there is Visharadena Parameshwarena Datta, so given by the Supreme Person known as Visharada. So the Vaisharadi is taken as being given by God. This God given, um, or this, uh, this God given uh, Devi. So Devi means, so he's, what he wants to get at, the reason he's using Devi and translating is Dyotamana. He's talking about the Vidya aspect of Vidya and Avidya. So he's making that clear by using the word Devi, Maya. So Vidya is also a part of Devi, Maya, but it's the Dyotamana. It's the luminous portion of material nature. So the Sankhya system and the Yoga system, they say that Maya has two purposes that uh, Prakriti has two purposes. One is Bhoga and one is Apavarga. That one is engaged in, one uh, in, in is, uh, ex it's for experience and for release from experience. Bhoga means to experience happiness and distress. And it also, the function of Prakriti is to give us liberation from itself. So um, Prakriti functions like that. It, it's one of the purposes of Prakriti. We talked about that before. We have Swartha and Parartha. So Parartha, the Prakriti is functioning for the sake of the Purusha, and therefore it is uh, Parartha. And it's doing so, it's giving Bhoga and Apavarga. So then Dyotamana, Matir. So all these words are in, in apposition. They're all nominative and they're all feminine words, words. So you can say that this is that, this is that, and so on. So it is, Matir means Vidya. So now he comes to the end point. He's saying that this is, that this Matihi means Vidya. So this Vidya is of the luminous portion of Maya, uh, which is given by the divine person uh, in order that, so now he's going to explain that. So Vidya means Tadrupa Ya Maya Swarupa. So now this is the, this is Jiva Goswami's explanation of this material Vidya. So Swarup Shakti Vritti Bhuta Vidya Vir Bhava Dwara Lakshana Sattva Mayi Maya Vritti. So it's a function or an aspect of the material nature, Maya Vritti, in the mode of goodness, Sattva Mayi, which is characterized by being a door, Dwara, or a gateway uh, to the Avir Bhava, to the descent, to the appearance of the divine vritti, the divine vidya, the, uh, which is a function of the internal potency. The swarup shakti vritti bhuta vidya vir bhava dwara lakshana sattva mayi maya vritti. So that's the explanation of all those words there. So he's giving it to, uh, so, I, so my question about the antima, now obviously, Jiva Goswami is giving here a slant to this by bringing in Swarup Shakti, if you have an, a proper understanding of the word Vidya. So the idea, because this is coming up here in the third chapter there, you talk about in this later verses of the third chapter of the first canto, uh, you start to talk, you start to talk about the, the functions of the three gunas and how uh, Brahma uh, and uh, Shiva and Vishnu are the guna avatars and how Vishnu is the um, presiding deity of the sattva guna and how the sattva guna is the source or the gives the potential for transcendence. So it's the springboard 
or here it's used the word gateway. So vidya, the material vidya. So for material vidya, the vidya potency and the material nature that applies to both uh, the systems of yoga, jnana, as well as to bhakti. All right. So just let's finish up here. I've done over an hour, so uh, I don't want to go on too much longer. Uh, but uh, rather than splitting this up in two, I was just going with one. So sa, so that's sa yadi uparata nivrita bhavati tada vyavadhana bhasasyapi rahityat sampanno labda brahmananda sampatir eveti vidur munaya. So this is the second part of the verse, which starting with the uparata. So uparata means nivritta. So we had that nivritta in the previous verses in the in the uh, Kapila instructions. So uparata and nivritta, he's taking those as having the same meaning. So it comes to us. So nivritta, nirvana. There was this is not the same root. The nirvana and nivritta have no connection to each other, but nevertheless, uh, they are uh, somewhat um, uh, synonymous. But anyway, the stoppage, uparata, the nivritti of the of the that uh, of the uh, of the mental functions, or this vidya. So the vidya, we're talking about vidya and avidya, both have to come to a stop. So tada, vyavadhana bhasasyapi rahitya, because there is the complete uh, absence of even uh, a, a, a tiny. Uh, abhasa, the reflection or the, the shadow of abhyavadhana. So abhyavadhana of an, any kind of intervening potency. There's nothing that comes between you and Brahman, you and the Absolute. It's a sakshatkar, the sakshat, direct, aparokshanubhuti. There's no intervening uh, senses, no intervening mind, no intervening buddhi, no intervening ahanka. It's all direct perception uh, from soul to soul. The chit energy of the individual Atma and the chit energy of the, the, of the Supreme are d in direct contact with one another, with no nothing, no vyavadhana, no intervention. So when he's done that, then he becomes sampanna. So sampanna was the word from the, from the verse. And so now what does that sampanna mean? So Sampanna, I was saying, he's possessing something. So what does he possess? He possesses Labda, he has attained Brahmananda Sampati. He has attained the richness or the wealth of the ecstasy or the, the, the bliss of oneness with Brahman, of the Paramatattva. So this is stated, but this is known by the Munis. So Tatascha Tat Sampati Labhat Sve Mahimni Swarupa sampatau api mahiyate pujyate. So then, tat sampati labhat, having attained this wealth or this treasure, he is situated in his own glory, which means his swarup in his own essence or in his own essential being. He is in. He has the 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 riches of being situated in his own essential being. And so Mahiyate, he is glorified, he is exalted, he is worshipped. So, in other words, Prakrishta Prakasho Bhavati Ityartha. So he is situated in his. Uh, so the, situ the meaning is that it becomes clearly manifest to him. So let me read what's here so far. I think I'm going to be cha changing this. I perhaps should go and read what was originally there by, by Babaji. But in the state of living liberation or Jivan Mukti, is present the goddess, no, this is already wrong. So the goddess Devi, who is, okay, this is all wrong. So just accept the way that I did it. I'll have to re reword the translation. I, I did, I'm not happy with this at all. So let's just go to the, uh, to the, uh, so what Babaji has here as his commentary. So next, the Jiva describes the ultimate Utkranta Mukti. This happens after death. When the proud of the karma of a Jivan Mukta comes to an end, then his body drops, because the body is a product of proud of the karma, and it runs on it. Then uh, such a yogi becomes eternally situated in Brahman. 
So Sri Jiva Goswami, by com commenting on verse 1334, writes that the word Maya in this refers to a specific part of Maya in Sattva. This means that the Vidya part of Maya. This part is used to dispel the Avidya part of Maya, which consists of Rajas and Tamas. One may say that once the avidya is removed, then the vidya will read to mukti, as is confirmed by Krishna in 11.11.3. So Krishna also said that sattva gun gives a rise to knowledge, and knowledge leads to experience of Brahman. To this, Sri Jiva Goswami replies that this vidya part cannot lead to mukti, but is only a gateway uh, to the other vidya, which belongs to the intrinsic potency of Bhagavan. Therefore, when it is said that vidya or jnana leads to mukti, that is not the popular vidya, but a specific part of the intrinsic potency of Bhagavan. This is clear from verse 332-23. The knowledge mentioned in this verse arises from bhakti, which is an intrinsic potency of Bhagavan. Well, I'm going to stop there, and I'll, uh, in the, uh, uh, I think that the references should be added here, otherwise the it becomes obscure for the reader. But that is going to be it for today. If you want to uh, check the, uh, the, uh, the blog where I'll be giving uh, a synopsis and some of these other things will be, uh, I'll give you the translations of the verses that are referred to, including this one, these uh, 1417, Sattva gives rise to knowledge, 11.11.3 and 3.32.23 that are all in the commentary. Jai Jai Sri Radhe, Jai Jai Sri Radhe, Jai Jai Sri Radhe Sham. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinah, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu, Makaschid Dukkha Bhagavavet. Om Shanti 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 Hariyom Tat Sat. Jai Jai Sri Radhe, Jai Jai Sri Radhe, Jai Jai Sri Radhe, Shyam.